Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the 2020 Georgia Tech Manufacturing Institute Fall Lunch and Learn Series. My name is Paige Shee, Strategic Partners Officer for GTMI. The GTMI is one of 11 Georgia Tech interdisciplinary research institutes. Uh, we uniquely focus on manufacturing research, development, and deployment. We help tackle the grand challenges of today's manufacturers and help our partners move innovations from the lab to the marketplace. GTMI has a wide array of facilities and equipment located both on main campus for basic research and nearby in our applied manufacturing pilot facility on 14th Street for more applied research. GTMI's mission includes education and workforce training, collaborative partnerships with industry, academia, and government, as well as thought leadership. Each semester, GTMI hosts a Lunch and Learn series. This fall, sessions are held every Monday at noon as live online events. These sessions are excellent opportunities for Georgia Tech faculty, students, and researchers, as well as our growing global manufacturing community, to learn and share advanced manufacturing knowledge. To ensure a smooth presentation experience today, all audience members are automatically muted. However, we encourage you to submit any questions you may have for today's speaker using the Q&A panel as they come to mind. And uh, to ensure a smooth experience, we will run through those questions at the end of the lecture. Today, I'm pleased to introduce Eric Bosenhart, who will present on the topic of cell therapy facility design. As novel cell-based therapies come to market over the next few years, the industry will need to mobilize rapidly and build commercial production facilities that are dedicated to these therapies, yet flexible enough to adapt to evolving needs. Eric Bosenhart is a process manager and bioprocess subject manager expert for IPS Integrated Project Services in Raleigh, North Carolina. He's a published author of over 30 technical papers, a conference presenter on process technologies and operations, and active in developing industry guidance documents. He has led several biological manufacturing projects, including over 12 cell therapy and ex vivo gene therapy projects. He has a BS in chemical engineering and an MBA, both from the University of Delaware. So please join me in welcoming Eric Bosenhart. Eric, you may go ahead and begin your presentation. All right, thank you for that introduction. Uh, so today we're gonna to talk a little bit about cell therapy facility design. Uh, one of the things that you know we've been starting to hear about it's really in the last few years is about the, these new therapies. Uh, you know, we, we had you know Vardis coming out with with something. Then we hear about these really expensive gene therapies that are are you know curing blindness. And let's talk a little bit more about what does it take to manufacture those and the facilities around them. So we're going to start off by defining. It. I mentioned two things in my introduction about you know the cell and gene. What does what it, how's it, what's it all mean for us? Um, can I talk through some of the different processes that are out there, the general flows, the key aspects of compliance, um, walk through some of the, the typical operations that we would see, and then after we've gained a little bit of understanding about what do we need for these um, cell therapy facilities, then we can start taking a look back and saying, okay, how do we bring it all together and come up with solutions? So. Uh, there's two, you know, there's two major bodies, uh, regulatory bodies that we're usually looking at are um, the EMEA and the US FDA. Uh, a lot of the other agencies throughout the world are, are very, following very similar guidelines. Those are two, two usually leading the way. Uh, in the EU, they call things, as, you know, as, as advanced uh, therapeutic medicinal products. And then they kind of break them down to, to further, you know, levels of uh, granularity. Um, I'm talking about gene therapies, things that modify an actual gene within the body. Uh, and that could be, you know, done in the body in terms of the administration or could be done external to the body the modification and then placed back into the body. Uh, we're also looking at, you know, pure cell therapies where we're taking um, stomach cells and we're, we're putting them back into a person, uh, some of the uh, stem cell therapies out there. Uh, and then a lot of times we, we wind up with, okay, maybe we need to replace something, you know, actual physical part of the body. 
Now we start getting into regenerative medicine and tissue engineered medicines. And those also wind up also affecting the structure of the body. So we tend to wind up with them being uh, combination products as devices and, and, a, and a drug product. Um, so it's, it's a little bit of a strange thing to think about cells um, as for administration as a drug product. Uh, traditionally, we're used to refining down to some known molecule. Um, in, in the U.S., the, F, the FDA's guidance is a little uh, more succinct and doesn't go into the same level of detail, uh, but they do kind of put that, those gene therapies and cell therapies all in one. Uh, and just for clarification, throughout the, the, the rest of the presentation, I'll try to mention when I say gene therapy, when I'm talking about in vivo or ex vivo, because um, it's going to have a, you know, a little bit of a different impact in terms of what the process looks like. Um, again, these are not slides that right now that you're going to dive into, read, and say, hey, here's all the regulations. And this is more of a reference, uh, but there are specific guidelines uh, and regulations out there uh, for cell and gene therapies. Uh, you know, your, your, your general regulations that you see for good pharmaceutical practices are still applicable, um, but there's some additional guidelines. And then you can drill even further down on the clinical side, the development side, um, by disease state, uh, the FDA has additional guidance for gene therapies and cellular therapies. Uh, but there's just way, way too many to put on here. Um, it kind of loses the message. Uh, in the EU, you have, again, your same basic directives um, with one little caveat. Uh, they actually did create a separate section um, that is focused solely on ATMPs. Uh, so there's some very specific regulations in there. Uh, one of the things that sometimes comes up is uh, like incubators when we have multiple patients in an incubator. Well, the, there's actually a EU regulation now that says those need to be exhausted. That's all in here. Uh, and then there's some other additional guidelines that are out there that they've been developing. But in terms of providing specific regulation, the EU is a little further ahead. The FDA has put together a lot of guidance documents, but not additional regulation. So as we start talking about therapies and the different types of therapies out there, um, two big categories emerge, allogeneic and um, autologous. So I'll, we'll talk about allogeneic first. Allogeneic is where the source of the cells or tissue or whatever we're administrating is not the same as the subject. And that's what we're traditionally used to. I don't have to provide a biopsy in order to go to the doctor to, to receive treatment for something. Uh, and so there's some cell and gene therapies out there, currently approved, that go this route. Um, right now, most of them are, are gene therapies. So they're looking to, to you know, they're in vivo uh, gene therapies. Uh, there is some things out there relating to cord blood, that's allogeneic, um, but still actually cellular administration. But there's a lot of uh, autoimmune system challenges when we start using something that's not from one person's body and implanting into another person's body if it's a cell. So that's where a lot of autologous therapies have been gaining approval. Uh, and this is where the source is from the donor, uh, whether it's from a, a biopsy or an apheresis. And, you know, you have some of the more new age uh, CAR-T therapies that have been approved that work off of an apheresis from a patient, get processed and returned to that same patient with the modified uh, T-cell. Uh, but then you also have some very, some more traditional I mean, products that, that are, have been out there and that have been cellular um, therapies for a long time, but we just don't pay as much attention to them. Things like cartilage. 
Um, so Carcel has been out, has been approved much longer than, than all these other products, but yet we don't, we don't think about it. And, and they've come up with a way to deal with an autologous um, product. One of the biggest things to think about in the cell and gene therapy space is really going a holistic design for your process. Particularly in the autologous space where I'm coming from a patient and getting back to the patient, it's absolutely crit critical. Even in allogeneic, I mean, the, the, the different permutations that can happen along the path, along the journey, need to, need to be considered. We need to look at, you know, not just the, how we buy from raw materials, we throw them in the bioreactor and move on. We've got to step back a little further because there's extra risk associated with a lot of these therapies. So what do these therapies look like? What's the process to make them? Well, if it's a, a stomach cell therapy, it's a straightforward cell culture. I take the, take the biopsy, take the donation, and I just grow it up. Most of the time, because it's uh, human cells, they're adherent lines. Um, I'm using some sort of 2D culture system, or eventually you might get larger systems, microcarriers. Um, a lot of manual operations there. A lot of risk because you know we're trying to you know progress these cells along, keep the whole process sterile. Um, then also we have uh, our gene therapies, which okay, we're working with viral vectors. So hey, oh great, we know how to process viral vectors. We've been doing this for years. Uh, with vaccines. And by and large, that's true. Um, there, there are some challenges with that, though, because um, we are looking to have a, a live active virus um, along the way, whereas most of the vaccines out there are attenuated. And so we're not, we're, we're having to put extra scrutiny on, on our process and maintaining the sterility and, and endotoxin, uh, you know, reduction along the way. And then you wind up with some really complicated things. Um, so, you know, CAR T's and induced pluripotent stem cells. Um, you were, we're doing microbiological practices, um, that have been pioneered in, in clinical labs. And now we're trying to, to keep them in that same level of aseptic and detailed handling that the clinician had. And we're trying to expand that from a, this hospital, this clinician was able to save somebody's life to, now we have a cure for hundreds of thousands of people. And that's a big manufacturing challenge. That's a big process repeatability challenge. So it, let's start at the beginning. How do we start tackling those challenges? Uh -huh. And the autologous, which is where you know, a lot of this CAR T stuff is living, uh, we're we're going from one donor to one to one patient. You know, one donation is one batch, one patient. Uh, we're really not looking at banking, so we get one shot. Um, a lot of the CAR T patients have um, gone through multiple you know, rounds of of chemotherapy, radiation, or other uh, treatments. Uh, for their cancers and are not really in a position to be there um, to provide multiple donations, um, either from a, you know, uh, a frailty standpoint um, or, or just from, from timing. So we need to think about that. How do we preserve that along the way through the whole process without losing that one batch? Whereas in traditional biotech, we lose a batch. It hurts our production capacity for, of the facility. Um, it's a little different in an autologous process. Um, allogeneic, we have much more uh, flexibility. It's more back to what we're used to. A lot of, of materials fails. We can get another lot. Um, and <clears throat> but you know when we're looking at, at donations um, for, in an autologous sense. That we need to work through a couple of different things from an immune perspective. Potentially, there's a way to reprogram it, maybe through an induced stem cells. Um, 
for pooling donations potentially to try to even out some of the uh, factors, or we're looking at a non-mammalian cell line um, that's not going to have the same sort of rejection uh, properties. And then with all these cells that we're coming with coming in, you know, how are we going to do this? Are we going to go fresh or frozen in terms of how the, it's being delivered to the facility? Um, uh, Dendrion for, you know, originally started off with um, working with, with fresh apheresis. Uh, and then it quickly realized that in order to cover the entire nation, um, they had to take a little bit of the viability hit and go with frozen. Um, otherwise, they just weren't, they weren't able to serve the patient population. Uh, as we look through growing up the cells, um, Again, we're, we're coming out of a lot of really cutting edge research that's been practiced clinically, that is in clinical trials. And those are not always the most developed processes. There isn't a platform process for the industry yet. It's not like you can say, oh, a bad process. Okay, it's going to look like this, 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 and this. And these vendors have been working on single-use systems for this process for the last 15 years, and we have a nice, optimized, closed process. Now, we're still working in biosafety cabinets. We're relying on procedures for segregation between patients and uh, maintaining sterility of our process. Um, and that's got some challenges as we scale up. You know, in clinical trials, we have to do a couple hundred patients a year out of a facility, that's what they, now we're talking about thousands of patients every week, that becomes a big challenge. So that's where we need to start looking at how do we bring those into closed systems uh, and also automate the processes. I'll talk through a little bit more about some of the different um, opportunities that are out there uh, by unit operation. Um, and one of the big things is this is also going to help us with our segregation strategy. It's going to help us with our sterility. Um, for autologous, there's a couple of opportunities out there. Um, a lot of a 2D cell culture systems out there that are that are closed. Um, the Nook cell factories are, are one example. Um, but you know some of the corning the corning stuff to their hyperstacks, cell stacks, all those different things can become can come with. Um, sterile tubing uh, ends on them to be manipulated in, uh, in a closed fashion. Uh, Lanza has the Octane uh, Cocoon system, which is a, a small uh, device that's a self-contained bioreactor. We have a picture of one of those later on. Um, and then Milchini Prodigy is another solution that's a, a kind of an all-in-one benchtop unit. Um, they've kind of Come into this with the idea of developing a medical device that kind of changes the paradigm on its head. You don't, you don't manufacture a product in a facility. You deliver a device to a hospital and they execute a protocol to make a product. Kind of a different mentality. Um, and then if we're able to get to uh, suspension systems, um, then we get back to some more traditional uh, type of um, bioreactors and stuff like that. But uh, at this scale, you're not likely to really get there and need large volumes because um, it's going back, you know, in Tullis, it's going back to a single patient. Um, and then there's some other custom solutions out there for manipulating adherent cell cultures. Uh, when we start talking about allogeneic, now we're, we're talking about a wide group of products. Um, some of them may still be adherent cell cultures. Uh, could be our, our viral vectors uh, for uh, in vivo uh, gene therapies, uh, and or maybe secreted cell products. So it kind of changes the way you know how we look at things. Now now we can go look at our you know, larger scale. Now, I'm not going back to a single patient. I need Instead of billions of cells, I need trillions of cells um, in a batch. Um, so, okay, if I still have an adherent, well, then I need to look at maybe a fixed bed type of bioreactor or look at microcarriers. 
Um, so here's just an example of one opportunity where starting in, in a, uh, this was an allogeneic product, started off in uh, multiple corning cell stacks, and then using the same technology, same inherent cell structure uh, that was put into an automated system and the ends, tubing ends and process parts were closed. Um, to you know, improve their efficiency, reduce their variability, and, um, and enable them to really scale their process. I, again, at CAR-T, I may be dealing with T-cell, uh, T-flasks, uh, just filled with T-cells, and I don't need billions of them. Uh, I have a finite volume that I can reintroduce back into the human body. So maybe uh, something smaller, and, and it's where this uh, uh, Wilson Wolf G Rex comes in. It's a nice little closed system. It's just for an incubator, basically right in place of a T flask. And then, if, you know, again, why would we consider 3D microcarriers, uh, reactors with, with microcarriers? Um, really, because it's going to allow us to drive up how much we can get out of a facility. And do it all still in a closed manner and improve the cost of goods. And I say, oh, well, why are we concerned about the cost of goods? Why are we concerned? We got to do what's right for the patient, you know, regardless of cost. And well, yes, we need to do what's right for the patient. But at the same time, when we talk about treatments that cost, ha cost half a million dollars an eye, so if you want both eyes uh, to, to prevent your, your blindness from a degenerative disease, you're looking at a million dollars. We need to do better in terms of reducing the cost of goods so that we don't have to be charging that much as an industry. Uh, and then some of the other fixed bed technologies out there by Cellus. And then the, here's a picture of the cocoon. It's, again, it's a very small device. Again, it's kind of envisioned as more of a potentially a point of care, you know, a hospital use, or it's a fully automated cassette you load in. Um, when it comes to, to harvesting the cells, um, some of the stuff is still very manual, um, but we don't want to keep doing that. We don't want to cool off of tea flasks into centrifuge tubes or, or bottles. Uh, we want to look at trying to find uh, ways of closing that process. Uh, depending upon the size, we could be looking at something for an allogeneic process like a Notorious KSAP or car unifuge with both single single use centrifuges. Um, from an autologous standpoint, um, there's the smaller benchtop um, units like a GE, Cytivia, uh, CPAX, or a Miltini Prodigy. And speaking of Miltini, uh, their uh, uh, magnetic beads, uh, affinity beads, uh, have become pretty much a, a standard in the CAR-T uh, space for selectively binding to the modified cells and purifying them out. So the magnetic bead binds to the cell, uses the magnet fully, transforms cells away from the other T cells. Um, and then there's some other potentials out there for harvesting using tangential flow filtration um, for whole cells. Um, it can get a little tricky with the uh, shear forces, though. You wind up with a lot of uh, uh, aggregates and degradation of the cells. Uh, again, this one here is really, it's a lot of an eye chart in terms of all the data on it. Uh, basic takeaway from this is your closed system is going to be a lot cheaper to operate and give you a lot more flexibility in your facility. Whereas you're more traditional working in a biosafety cabinet with the extra classification and gowning around it is going to be your most expensive option. Um, so what do we do when, we, when we've made these products? What's the next step? Um, we've got to fill them. And, and there's some real challenges here in filling. Um, in the autologous world, again, I, I really need to understand What's the next step with the patient? Is this a an injection? Is this an infusion? 
that's going to try and drive me towards, you know, do I want this in a vial or a vat? And, and even then, if I'm working with live cells, I have a finite time that they can be in a cryopreservative. So I need to move quickly and I need to time that out. Look at, a, look across the whole process. How do I do that? How do I map that out? And if I need to process many vials, many bags, or an allogeneic therapy of host cells, well, I can't take a full eight hour shift to fill things and label them and inspect them. Uh, I'll have lost my cell count. My viability would have, would have gone to pot. And then we're almost always uh, freezing these to uh, cryogenic temperatures, so liquid nitrogen, which is, again, something that we, we don't always have in our biotech facilities. That's a little different. Another opportunity here is we need to look at, when we talk about segregation, contamination control, um, the gene therapies themselves um, are live viruses. So there is a potential that um, they could hurt the operators. Um, and also we have some challenges with identifying in a multi-product facility potential contamination. So we're looking at things like how do we keep the entire process closed? Do we be, and how do we how do we clean the rooms and build that level of control? And so that's where sometimes we're, we're using vaporized hydrogen peroxide to decom the rooms. Um, but we need to be cognizant of whether it's VHP or spore cleanse or Vespi, whatever chemical we're using, that's now has a potential to get to our, our products. Um, you know, and we don't think about it as much in terms of the, the, you know, the very, very minute levels, but when we're dealing with very fragile cells that are going to be very sensitive, um, we have to keep an eye on that. Um, with some of the filling technologies out there, um, if I'm going into a vial, I'm going to be looking at uh, some potentially closed vial filling. Um, it's not 100% closed, but it is because uh, there's still, you know, still have a, you know, a needle that's going into the septum uh, to fill it into in, in filled liquids inside of a pre-sterilized vial. Uh, but it is a significantly reduced risk. Um, the facility that uh, manufactures the, that type of product, uh, they've actually um, have been running GMP. Uh, they're just doing testing, demonstrating this to clients, and they're not really a controlled facility, and they have not, haven't had a contamination. Um, but still, from a regulatory aspect, that end of that needle is open, so it is open even though they call it closed vial filling. So it still needs to be in an isolator, um, have that extra classification around it for the current uh, sterile processing guidance. Um, yes, they cost a little bit more, but they're also uh, a much lower risk of a contamination or failure. And for, you know, for making that half a million dollar in eye gene therapy, it might be worth it to have that level of assurance in there. Um, but if I'm still doing larger volumes, I can still look at where my cost of goods is going to be prohibitive. Then I can still look at traditional vials, but maybe now I need to look at uh, isolator technology and, and robotic filling uh, for small scale uh, filling. To try to still in that, that 500 to 1,000 vials of batch range, um, there's units out there that can do that and really drive that high level of sterility assurance. Um, and again, you know, if, if we're looking at an infusion-based product, bags are a very easy way to go. Um, autologous is pretty much this is the standard. Go into a, the infusion bag, freeze the bag, all ready to go. Um, for allogeneic, they tend to be in, in vials. Um, with the amounts of, of units, and batches that we're going to be manufacturing. Uh, we really need to look at the logistics. So let's just think about this. You know, if, I, if I'm making a monoclonal antibody, 
you know, I have a, a bioreactor train, I can get, you know, maybe 20 batches a year, 23 batches a year out of that bioreactor train and treat hundreds of thousands, if not millions of patients from that bioreactor train and over with 23 batches or 20 batches, somewhere in that. If I want to build a facility that's going to treat 20,000 people, I'm going to have 20,000 batches go to that facility in an autologous therapy. So that's a thousand times the number of batches that I have to process, all unique. So we can't just rely on what we've done in the past in terms of track and trace. Cold chain management is, going to be, is critical for most of these therapies because we are delivering either a live virus or live cells. So if we have an excursion, it will impact the viability and the efficacy of that product. Um, so getting a little bit more into some of the facility architecture, how, how do we lay out these facilities to potentially handle 20,000 patients a year, 20,000 batches a year? Um, well, we need to follow the, the logical operational steps and, that, and set the facility flow in that manner. Uh, really want to try to eliminate as much as we can crossover because um, we don't want batches mixing, we don't want raw materials and waste mixing, um, creating those opportunities for errors and mistakes. Um, so it's, it's one of these things where we, we look at facilities, particularly um, earlier stage facilities that are still working a lot in biosafety cabinets, it's how do we build that segregation in so that somebody working in this biosafety cabinet doesn't accidentally contaminate what's going on in that biosafety cabinet and really comes down to building the flow patterns really understanding what your material flows are wasted intermediates um, and looking at it all so we want to use the directional flow as much as possible we're separating people and material um because this this way also helps us reduce our our bio burden that's coming into our the clean rooms um, and potentially making it to the product. Uh, wherever we can, as we develop these processes, look to, wait, look to automate. How, how can I take the operator out of this? And there's both from a decision-making perspective, but also from a, from a handling manipulation perspective. Um, and then, you know, just the general facility construction, making sure that we're, we're using truly resilient, cleanable services that can withstand um, you know, our harsh chemical sanitizations. Um, some other compliances to keep in mind is, uh, I mentioned a little bit earlier about potentially operators being impacted by uh, gene therapies and the, the, the live virus. Well, it's a little more than that. It's not just gene therapies. It's the human donor material. Um, it's typically defaulted to a BSL two because patients aren't screened. We aren't sure what their what their what what viruses they have, and then you start screening these patients. Um, and so we get into this ethical conundrum of: Do I not treat patients who have hepatitis or have HIV? Um, so we wind up having to say, no, we really don't want to go there. We're just going to have to accept the material as it is and work with it in terms of the, the biosafety level um, that we need to prevent to protect the operator and also protect other batches uh, from other patients at the same time. Um, and some of our uh, host cells that we've been using for Gene therapies um, in vivo, gene therapies um, like the uh, HEK293 cells um, are also classified as BSL2. So what does that mean um, if I'm doing something in biosafety level 2? Uh, 
well, again, we got we got to build this into our containment strategy. So now, the rooms where I'm having that sort of processing going on, um, I need some sort of barrier um, to the rest of the facility. So bubble sink type airlocks. Um, it will, again, something we have to risk assess whether it's applicable to our process or not. Uh, whether HEPA filtered exhaust makes sense. Uh, we're going to have to segregate bio waste from a decontamination standpoint. It needs to be handled a little differently because we're going to have to have use a qualified um, uh, disinfection process from other, you know, more traditional uh, bio waste, which doesn't have to meet the same level of rigor. So kind of bringing a couple of things together, um, talking about some of the logistical challenges, improving the automation of the facility to reduce variability in the product. Uh, we look at, at automation facility, what does it mean? So it, it means we want to see a full batch record, making it in an electronic format, uh, where we have a manufacturing execution system that's sitting at a high level, that's keeping track of what's going on, the individual stages, helping with some of the scheduling, um, both from a equipment utilization, operator standpoint, and also helping us manage transfers. Um, one of the things that's, that's really big in the autologous ther cell therapy space is custody transfers. Um, I'm taking a donation from, or biopsy from a patient and I have to return it back to the same patient. And very much like, you know, uh, you know, in a hospital where, you know, every every step of the way they keep asking you, okay, what's your what's your, what's your what's your name, what's your birthday? Um, every time somebody comes in to affirm who you are, and that the me that whatever they're they're looking at, and the orders they have match patient. We're we're having to do that throughout this whole process and keep an inventory of everything that's going into that process. So it's it's almost like serialization um, on steroids. And how do we manage that? Well, if we're talking about 2,000, 20,000 batches a year, the only way I'm going to effectively manage that is using electronic batch records. Tying that into the MES, so then this provides that yeah, bottom level data gathering, recording, and um, to some extent, you know, prompting, um, helping the operators through this process. And barcoding is going to be a major aspect of any commercial scale facility out there to try to pull some of that uh, manual operations into a control defined operation. We've managed as an industry starting up and getting through um, the first for some clinical trials with the more traditional placards and such, but it does become um, a big challenge as we look at the scale uh, for the patient population we have to treat. And potentially in the future, maybe we can automate this some further and get to more robotics um, and look to uh, automated guided vehicles. Uh, for delivery and handling of uh, some of the things. And again, you know, I, I've never been preached that we're going to be 100% robotic. Um, you know, we focus robotics and automation in a place that makes sense. You know, the dull, the dirty, and the dangerous. So from a facility standpoint, we just need to kind of keep that in mind and not make little closets where people have to work. But think, how can I how can automate this in the future? How would I bring something like that in? So with all those considerations, I'm talking about the process, what are the big drivers? Well, we're talking about therapies that can really change people's lives. Um, you know, like these CAR-T therapies, people who have gone through uh, you know, multiple re relapsed cancers and now effectively cured um, 80, 90% of the time. So speed's big for patient impact. It's also big for, for the companies, you know, being the first one to market, you know, for a particular indication. Um, and then once we get there, once we get to market, getting it out to everybody, 
the scale up or scale out uh, challenges. Uh, adaptability. I hate to say it, but we're still we're developing these processes on the fly with the emphasis on speed and meeting the patient's need, helping them, uh, particularly for these uh, terminal diseases. We're, we're moving quickly and we're not taking the time to optimize the processes. So we need to keep in mind that once these processes become commercial, we'll come back through and do optimizations. So we need to think about that. How will we design the facility to be flexible enough to work with different variations on the process? Um, and with that said, we're rushing things through in hopes that they're going to help patients. Some cases, they really don't make a difference. And those products fall off the market. Um, and we don't want to be left with facilities that can't use for anything else. So thinking about from an operation standpoint, what can I make as interchangeable parts? How, so then this way, I could be adaptable, but I could also be fast. So I put up these two pictures here, and it's a, it's a little gimmicky. Um, what, what, is this, what is this projector and pair of slippers have? And heated slippers have an atomic. A USB connection. They both get power from USB, uh, and one gets data from USB also. How, but how does, I mean, they're doing very different functions, very different things. Well, again, it's going back to standardization of parts. What the, the end piece, what it's doing, I'm not as concerned about. But what I'm defining is how does it fit? What is the shape? What are the electrical power and data throughput that I can get to that connector? So that's where we come into the idea of modularity on facilities. We're working with standard size modules, standard configurations, so they're quick to deliver. Um, and that can be added in phases as, as the need changes or the, or the scale changes. Um, we did uh, one project where we started in December uh, 2017, and we were able to get the facility designed, built, and qualified to start trials in Q4 2018. Uh, that's what modularity does. It enabled us to go quickly, but still deliver a high-quality facility. So how do we do that? Well, we kind of look at what are these the process operations? How do we build them into reasonably sized pieces that can be shipped over the road. And then that's our core clean room and equipment. Then we look at the rest of the infrastructure around it. What do we need to do from a facility enabling standpoint to make that happen? And so we wind up with this blend of off-site, non-site construction. That can kind of sway one way or another depending upon the locale and the, uh, the need. And there's some uh, you know, implications in terms of uh, repeatability to take this out to multiple facilities, um, also from a you know, financial perspective, tax and depreciation, and also safety of taking more construction uh, off-site. Um, so here's that same facility I was talking about before that had the timeline from December 2017 to Q4. Uh, 2018, uh, what we did is we built out that first top slither of, of clean rooms up there, the blue spaces, um, with the uh, Uberflex, Cellflex, um, in the open configuration. So those are all um, grade B, ISO 7 and operation type spaces with biosafety cabinets, because that's what the process was at the time that we uh, started the project. And then we we didn't build out the rest of it at the time. We pl space planned it for continuation of the same concept, but we also space planned it with switching to other types of modules. Um, shown on the on one side, showing you know going to a closed process for cell therapy, and also um, bringing in the GeneFlex module, which effectively is a viral vector manufacturing facility. 
And so the way that we were able to plan and design this facility in a modular fashion has enabled uh, this particular facility to continue to grow and expand as the process evolves and the commercial scale increases from the first uh, couple hundred patients that they rolled in clinical trials um, to the several thousand that they plan on be treating uh, uh, every year now. Um, and also allowed them to insource their viral vector manufacturing uh, for their CAR-T therapy rather than having to rely on a third party uh, further reducing their risk and their, their control over their supply chain. All right. Um, so that's it for me right now. Is there any questions from the audience? Thank you very much, Eric. Um, very timely presentation. Uh, you know, I think all of us may now or, or will in the future know someone who could benefit from cell and tissue engineered medical products. So it's and from my perspective, a universally important topic. And I'll just say for Georgia Tech and GTMI specifically, it's certainly an important strategic focus of ours. Um, an important research thrust is uh, cell and tissue engineering and manufacturing. So thank you very much. And maybe I'll just kick off the Q&A with a question that came to mind for me while we wait to um, allow the audience to submit other questions. But I was curious, you know, with the, the various clients you work with, if you, how often you see a client that handles all the steps in the process, you, you laid out various steps from the manufacturing to filling. And then of course, I don't, I don't know that you talked about distri distribution, um, but how often your clients are handling all aspects of the process or are they relying on partners um, to help with them with various parts of the process? Well, I think they're always relying to partners uh, to some extent. Uh, one of the things to keep in mind is, is you know, particularly with, with the cell therapies that are autologous, we're, we're having to partner with hospitals and clinicians at the very beginning of the process to bring it all the way through to our manufacturing facility, turn back, turn it back around. Um, you know, the pharmaceutical companies out there are typically not doing their own logistics in terms of the actual shipment. Um, so they're working with a partner, whether it's UPS or Cryoport, to do that. Um, and furthermore, again, you know, they're, they're looking to mitigate their risk in as they start in clinical trials. So some people are looking to uh, contract development and manufacturing organizations, CDMOs, to offset some of that risk. And so they're going to Catalans and Lanzas of the world and saying, can you develop our process and get it through clinical trials? We we'll worry about commercial manufacturing when we have an approved product. Uh, so it, there's a whole mix out there. I think as companies get closer to commercial scale, they're bringing more and more in-house is what we're seeing. Uh, so they may use a CMO or CRO to do some initial work, um, but when it comes down to commercial manufacturing, they're almost always insourcing. And then even some of their raw materials, like I mentioned, the, the, the viral vector for CAR-T, uh, just trying to bring that in-house as much as possible um, because they're worried about supplier disruptions and they want their, their control, as much control as they can get. Mm -hmm. well, thank right. you. It looks like we have an additional question that came in yep. from uh, Hazel Stevens. Could you expand on why epoxy coated drywall is not a good idea in design? Yeah, so uh, epoxy wall, uh, epoxy coated drywall is something that we've really moved beyond in, in most uh, facilities. There's a lot of uh, facilities out there that still have that. Um, but what happens with you wind up with some, some minor damage to the wall just from operations, carts, all sorts of things. Uh, now you have a, a break in that epoxy. Now we have a spot for water or worse, our cleaning solutions to get back to the drywall. The drywall will hold moisture. Um, even if you go with some of the, like the cement board type stuff, then those, those are very high particulate generators. Um, if you have an, a, you know, a ding in them, 
Um, so we try to avoid them because it, it, there's not a long-term robust facility uh, tends to wind up with higher maintenance costs and, and challenges. Thank you. We have an additional question from Billy D. Brown. Uh, can you discuss your role as a process manager and subject matter expert and how you acquire and assist clients on a daily basis? Okay. Uh, so I'll touch that as kind of two, two pieces there. One is the process manager. Um, I'm responsible for managing a group of engineers and getting the right engineers to the right projects, uh, making sure that they're, that for the projects that we're looking at, you know, everybody has the right talent to, to fill to fill the projects in, in their time frame. Uh, and then as a subject matter expert, I'm coming in, um, I'm working with clients uh, at various levels. So if I get a startup biotech, they may be looking to me more to, to talk through whole process. Hey, we have an idea. We have something that's in preclinical. What, what do we need to do? What do we need to look at? What, and I can lay out development timelines and development paths, things to consider along the way. Um, in addition to programming facilities, coming up more with a business plan of how we could scale up or scale out. Uh, then at the same time, you know, we have some larger clients that come in that, um, you know, we've, we've done development. You now we're going ahead. This is kind of our process. This is what we want to do. Okay. In those cases, I'm coming in and providing, providing more of a, a perspective and saying, okay, well, if we go ahead and we go that route, this is, this is some of the compromises you could be making. Um, okay. So you've, you've chose to go this route. You know, maybe we just take a little bit of time and document the philosophy and really help set them up so, uh, for success when they go for that qualification, when they go for that BLA, uh, biological license, um, application so that they can move through with their concepts and their ideas. Okay. And you, you talked quite a bit about automation throughout your presentation. The next question relates to that. So what monitoring or sensor technologies are most needed and how can they be implemented in the cell therapy facilities? Well, I think first and foremost, it, it's a very simple one that many organ, many other industries have is, is just track and trace. Um, the, the amount of materials and building that pedigree behind a batch is, is a major uh, stumbling block for our, our current uh, paper-based systems. Uh, now, from a cell perspective, process perspective, um, definitely seeing uh, you know, cell viability is going to be a major aspect. And there's some uh, other potential analytics that people are trying to come up with for virus quantification, whether it's the actual whole virus, you know, capsid, capsid empty, empty full, you know, how much of this can we bring to the process and be in line versus um, at line or, or offline? Um, I think those are some of the, the big ones out there. I think, you know, particularly the, the virus, you know, the, you know, in vivo gene therapy, the virus quantification is, uh, and, and the capsule load is, is still a big one that's challenging people. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it looks like this topic has um, inspired a lot of questions. So we have another question for Good. you. Um, how do you schedule your manufacturing operations? Do you forecast how many batches to manufacture in advance? Or do you schedule your shift on the fly when you receive new orders? In a highly generic world, I schedule the batches based upon a forecast because I can build stock. And so it'll run like most other biotech facilities in that manner. Maybe I wind up with more batches because I, I need to do some level of, of you know, uh, dosing by patient, which may be a very small volume. Uh, in the autologous world, it, it's a little bit more of uh, we, we staff for the maximum throughput. And as patients come in, as donations come in, we, we, we build them into the manufacturing schedule. 
Uh, does that mean we have to restrict when operations happen? Yes. Um, so all the CAR-T manufacturers right now, and actually the, the other uh, cartilage guy, uh, they're all working with the clinicians. They're all enroll. They're all qualifying and enrolling them as part of that process. Not only are they ensuring the quality of the donation and an eventual administration, but they're also looking at that scheduling so that they don't have 50 patients show up on their doorstep on Monday morning and they only have the capacity to work with 20. Okay. Thank you very much. I don't see any other questions at this time, but it looks like you've provided your contact information. Is it okay if the audience members contact you with questions after the presentation? Thank you so much for your time today, and thank you to our audience members for participating. I also wanted to let uh, everyone know that today's presentation will be recorded and uh, available on the GTMI website within a few days. And that URL is www.manufacturing.gotech.edu. And please join us next Monday for our next Lunch and Learn session, which will feature Dr. Sura Saha, Assistant Professor of uh, the Georgia Tech School of Manufacturing Engineering, uh, who will present on high throughput nanoscale additive uh, manufacturing. So thank you very much, Eric, once again. Thank you to our audience members and have a great afternoon. All right.